must constantly look at things in a different way. The Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast was created by two physical therapists out of the desire to learn more about the different educational roles in physical therapy and healthcare and how healthcare education works by talking with educational leaders and people with different perspectives within physical therapy and across interdisciplinary lines on how education can be improved to disrupt the status quo of healthcare education. This is our journey and thanks for listening. Are you a third-year physical therapy student that excels on tests when you have study guides, checklists, and deadlines? With all of the information available about how to prepare for the NPTE, it's easy to get disorganized and not feel prepared going into the big day. NPTE Prep Success is an online course that provides PT students easy-to-use study guides and step-by-step guidance through the NPTE preparation. To learn more, visit kylericeprep.com. Thank you again all for your continued support, and now for the show. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, and I'm Brandon Pollan. As always, I have the pleasure of being joined by my fellow co-hosts, F. Scott Beal and Stephanie Wyruck. And today, we have two very special guests to come on to talk about vestibular rehabilitation and educational issues and solutions, as we welcome Dr. Susan Whitney and Dr. R.J. Williams. Now, For those of you who aren't aware, Dr. Susan Whitney is a professor in physical therapy in the School of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences. She is the program director of the Centers for Rehab Services, Balance, and Vestibular Rehabilitation Center at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, and she is a member of the American Physical Therapy Association Board of Directors. And also for R.J. Williams, he is the COO of Physical Therapy and Balance Centers in Las Vegas and has been practicing physical therapy since 2013. Now, everyone, thank you so much for taking the time today to talk with us and for our listeners. Would you both mind giving our listeners some insight into who you are and kind of talking about your academic journey that has led you to where you're at today? And, and Sue, we'll start with you first, and then RJ, we can follow up with you after that, if that's cool. Sure. I'm a clinician who does research, so, and I teach also. So I have the pleasure of seeing patients at least once a week. And what I try to do is incorporate what I learn from my patients and what I write about and also what I do for research. Awesome. And uh, I am a practicing physical therapist in an outpatient setting uh, here in Las Vegas, like you mentioned. Um, And I do a little bit of clinical education through uh, two of the universities here in Las Vegas for PT programs, as well as uh, some of our PTA programs, getting them familiar and introduced with vestibular rehab uh, as well. Awesome. Well, guys, I'd love to hear your take on how prevalent you feel vestibular disorders are in the U.S. Sure. Uh, you know, I think there's a there's some evidence floating around out there. I did a, a quick search on the, the big vestibular org page that we have um, for professionals and, and for the public. And, you know, they project it somewhere around a third of the population experiences um, vestibular balance problems and you know they say about 70 million americans will experience uh, dizziness disorder sometime in their lifetime but i think sue would probably agree with me that um, the way that when we're in the clinic and we see some of these things it's probably well underreported um, or, or kind of camouflaged in a lot of other things so that number may be even higher i i agree so so if you look at the i think it was the german epidemiological study that came out uh, it was a population-based survey. They estimated about 3% of the German population had dizziness at, at any time. And if you look at, I think, Sloan's paper, which is dated but still interesting, that dizziness was the primary complaint of older adults over the age of 70 in terms of the most prevalent reason they actually showed up in the doctor's office. So, so it's extremely common. And one of the th- links that I'm seeing more and more, I'm sure RJ is too, is this link between being dizzy and falling down. So there's a couple papers, one, one that came out last year that I thought was really special, that talked about BPPV, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, which is such a common problem. Um, and after physiotherapy or PT intervention, uh, doing the Epley or whatever maneuver people did in this particular study, um, that six months later there were less falls. So it, it's not just that people are dizzy because that makes people miserable, but they also can fall down. My grandma actually, Sue, had an issue where 
she became dizzy and ended up having a pretty bad fall. So, I mean, in my personal life, that's affected me. And I'm sure many of our other listeners have had stories of patients or family members that have experienced that. You mentioned that BPPV was a relatively common vestibular condition. Um, what are some other common vestibular conditions that all healthcare providers should be aware of? And then, and could you just briefly break down some of those common features to help healthcare providers recognize those conditions and refer to the correct uh, provider? Let's start with the first part and I can answer that for sure. So you said, what are the other common problems? Uh, the, the things that are seen in the literature, in fact, I, I got a question like this from a guy from Germany recently asked the same question, oddly enough, of several of us from around the world. And probably a, what's called a vestibular neuritis or labyrinthitis is right up there uh, after BPPV in terms of prevalence. And that's where there's damage to the vestibular nerve. And it usually causes people to be dizzy. And in some cases, if it's labyrinthitis, they can lose some hearing. Third, at least when I gave him my estimate of, of what I see in, in my world is vestibular migraine. And that's, that's a condition that people are not really aware of. And it's definitely an underrecognized phenomenon. Um, and that's where people can actually be dizzy without a headache. And it can be a migraine. So that's why that, that condition is missed a lot because people are really unaware of how common vestibular migraine is. So those are some of the biggies. And then obviously you could have Meniere's disease that, that you don't see as often, but you can see that sometimes post-traumatically. Um, and and uh, certainly from just having Meniere's, which is probably an autoimmune disorder. If you count, not a peripheral problem, but we think it may actually be a central problem, although sometimes it's peripheral, concussion is absolutely huge. So we see tons of, of kids and adults with concussion. Um, I had three today that walked into the clinic because of their dizziness. And there's mounting evidence that what RJ and I do related to vestibular rehabilitation can help persons uh, living with dizziness and balance disorders post-concussion. But I answered part of your question. I'm not sure whether I got it all. No, that's great. Uh, do you have any advice to other practitioners? Um, Hanahada, you had mentioned the vestibular migraine is pretty hard for people to identify. Maybe expand on that a little bit and tell us how we as physical therapists can recognize it or other healthcare providers can recognize it and the provider that maybe sh the uh, patient should be referred to. Sure. And, and what you have to actually do is meet the International Headache Society's criteria for migraine to get have the diagnosis of vestibular migraine. And the I, if you just put in a web browser, IHS criteria, they pop, all right? There's a paper that was originally by Neuhauser that was translated into English by Rolf Jacob and Joe Furman that, that changed the, the, the original Neuhauser criteria to English. So that paper is available for the diagnostic criteria, um, which is really helpful. And then there's a new, and this is something that's really wonderful, the Baronet Society, which is a group of people who do research in the area of vestibular disorders around the world. Uh, the Baronet Society has come up with these consensus documents. And there's a recent consensus document on vestibular migraine that is probably the most recent paper re related to, to how do you identify vestibular migraine in your patient? And the criteria that the, mostly neurologists are on this panel, but the criteria for the condition are the same for a physical therapist as they are for a physician. So that paper is really helpful. And there, there are all of these consensus documents that were put together by the Baronet Society um, are actually listed. They're free from the Journal of Vestibular Research. So if you search Journal of Vestibular Research, um, you'll actually be able to just download that and you know, pull up the, the PDF for your files. So it's a really wonderful resource. Wonderful. And we'll definitely uh, put that resource in the show notes for our listeners if they want to look it up. RJ, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I actually have a follow-up question for Sue because um, I think being being practicing in this field, you know, sometimes if you get an opportunity to to collaborate and, and ask questions uh, interprofessional, 
for trends and things that you see. I want to know with Sue, with, with Meniere's, um, it's something that I've felt oftentimes, and, and it may be the, uh, more of like a classic diagnosis from practitioners, uh, medical professionals that would refer to patients to PT, that they were kind of lumping everything into that maybe in the last few decades. Um, but it was like if a patient was dizzy and it wasn't BPPV, um, I don't know why I feel like we were getting referrals for it all the time. But then when we would test them throughout uh, uh, our stuff, that they, they had signs that maybe mimicked more migraine or mimicked more um, like a, an uncompensated neuritis from years ago. Is that something that you would see similarly? Um, like over over diagnosis of that? I don't know whether I see over diagnosis, but I certainly see misdiagnosis just like you do. Okay. There's there's a, a couple of theories that, that are out there that Meniere's may be as many as six to 10 different autoimmune diseases. So that's part of why I think when you and I see these people, they some of them look really different. Some don't have hearing loss. They don't meet the the criteria from the American Academy of Head and Neck Surgery. Mm -hmm. So to to have the classic look of Meniere's, you have to have unilateral hearing loss, low frequency. You have to have ringing in the ear or tinnitus. You have to have oral fullness, and you have to have the vertigo that you cannot last up to 24 hours. And the problem is, is that, you know, there's the possible, probable, and definite Meniere's disease so that's part of the problem. And I, just like you, see, I've seen people that were misdiagnosed with Meniere's when they actually had migraine. And I've also seen people with mis have, have had multiple sinus surgeries when it's a migraine headache. Mm -hmm. Like, oh my gosh. So I, I, I can remember a guy so recently, and he's telling me the story of these two sinus surgery, three sinus surgeries that hadn't helped them. And I wanted to say, buddy, they didn't help you because you don't have sinus problems. <laughs> Not your problem. You have migraine. So it was a little bit tricky for me to direct him to the headache clinic, but I actually did send him to the headache clinic. I didn't obviously tell him that he didn't need to have those three surgeries. Uh, but when he went to the headache clinic and got some um, medical management there, he actually did very well. Yeah, so it's, 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 a, it's a real kick. I mean, you used to see a tough one to diagnose unless you see especially that low frequency hearing loss. What about, what about other common subjective and objective signs of um, other types of pathologies like BPPV? Can you expand, one of you expand on the subjective and objective signs that we would look for as clinicians? Um, sure. I mean, it, it, BPPV, I think for um, a good many of us that practice in that is one that when the patient comes in and starts to talk about it, you, you can tend to sniff it out pretty quickly because um, it tends to come in patterns that have very specific triggers um, that are, are much different than something more like a neuritis that uh, seems to just kind of irritate the system and send the person into to a tizzy where the I had a, a buddy who was at the gym text me one day and he said, dude, it was the weirdest thing. I know you, I, I know you deal with dizziness and vertigo stuff. I was getting off of a piece of gym equipment and I rolled to my right and I just fell right off and the world kind of started spinning for a few seconds. He's like, I've kind of avoided moving that direction and I've been okay, but I didn't like what I felt. And so for BPPV, you know, we tend to have like very specific um, position triggers that will cause it. Uh, where, you know, the duration, the, the, you know, short bouts of a few seconds are going to clue us a little bit more that way versus something that, you know, lasts for, um, you know, minutes to hours that may persist over a, a few days before it starts to kind of wind down. Um, that's, that's a big one in the subjective history for me. What about concussions? Can you guys expand a little bit on what you would find subjectively and objectively for concussions? Well, there's, there's a mass of, of symptoms that um, the post-concussion symptom scale is one I like the best that really give you a good perspective on what are potential symptoms that someone might have, such as uh, I'm tired, um, I have some nausea, I uh, can't think straight, I'm foggy, et cetera. So there's a, a list of questions. So that's very helpful. And at Pitt, um, Ann Muka developed a, a really neat questionnaire that's good to screen 
for whether you have a concussion versus not called the vestibulocular motor screen. And we've been using that uh, with persons with concussion and other people around the world have too. Um, that's a nice screening tool to, to help you. And we're actually looking at it to see change over time. And it does seem to, to change. There's some data that says that if you do poorly on that vestibulocular motor screen, at onset, uh, your prognosis isn't quite as good. So it can help a little bit direct uh, your care because you're going to be less aggressive with those people because you don't want to make them so symptomatic that you make them worse. So the, the, some people use the impact test. There's, uh, and I don't sell it, but it is made at the University of Pittsburgh. That's where it was originally developed. Um, there's other, other tools out there. There's a river mead scale that people use. There's uh, probably about five five or six others, uh, the military has their version. And so there's different scales, mostly um, given by psychologists that are pretty systematic looking at reaction time and things like that related to concussion. But that's a huge growing population of people who are dizzy that there's now, like I said, uh, real evidence that what we do can help them. I really enjoy using the VOMS um, from from Ann and uh, the people that worked on that. And um, it, it, it is a big constellation of symptoms that you're trying to just kind of rein in everything that you, you, you think are the biggest primary drivers of their complaints and um, grading them back into it. So it's, it's exciting to see where concussion and vestibular uh, mesh up very, very well. Indeed. And I think, you know, something before that we had, you guys had kind of mentioned earlier was kind of differentiating between maybe central drivers of dizziness and versus peripheral drivers of dizziness. And for the clinician out there who's maybe not having a lot of experience with kind of assessing and treating folks with dizziness, what are some of the key distinguishing features that to you or you're like, oh, that's more of a central thing. That's more of a peripheral thing. Just to kind of help maybe a clinician who's struggling initially to kind of help gain some better insight on what's either central or peripheral. I always liked the, the concept of like a two propeller plane uh, being your two vestibular organs and that plane flying nice and steady through the air. All of a sudden, one propeller slows down 30%. The plane's going to start to deviate and, and fly crooked. That is, to me, a good way to comprehend a peripheral dysfunction. If all of a sudden one of the ears is giving bad information or, or less information or, or overactive information, it's going to start to make the system uh, deviate and go crooked. It comes with generally that feeling of spinning or turning or, or difficulty with that. It's rather sudden, um, and it seems to be pretty specific, where central to me has always been a bit more vague, a, a little bit more complex, maybe a gradual onset. It doesn't seem to have like a, a specific moment or, or an attack that seems to, to have brought it on. And so those are kind of two big global pictures that I look at outside of um, getting into some details. If somebody has ataxia, it's not peripheral. Um, if you see what's called direction changing nystagmus, so if you were to look at someone and ask them to look 30 degrees to the right and at a target and their eye beat to the right, and then you ask them to look to the left 30 degrees to your finger and their eyes beat to the left, that's a brain problem. Okay, so that's one thing that is really helpful. Um, we do a test, and RJ was kind of saying about some of the specific tests, but if, if we do this test called the head impulse test, we move the head rapidly, and you look to see if the eyes can stay fixated on the target. And in central lesions, um, they, they instead of being positive, getting a jump, they actually can stay on the targets. So they actually have a negative test, which means that it's much more likely to be a brain lesion. And uh, so ataxia, the head impulse test, and erection change in nystagmus, that's, that's actually called HINTS, H-I-N-T-S. The Katas wrote about, uh, I think it was in 2009. And that particular, those constellation, those three tests are actually used in the emergency room. And that test, those, the combination of those three, um, was more sensitive than MRI. So that's something that I think phys physical therapists should know how to do in terms of uh, differentially diagnosing central from peripheral disorders. The other thing that you always look at too, and, and, and any physical therapist can do this, is you just observe the head and you want to see if it's tilted. So if, it's, if the head is tilted and one eye is higher than the other, probably a brain lesion. 
they, they, they call it a, a skew deviation. So if the head's tilted and one eye's higher than the other, that's bad, that's a red flag. So I, I, I worked with a PhD student um, a couple of years back and we actually wrote a paper about uh, for orthopedic physiotherapists uh, to, to be able to differentiate central versus peripheral lesions. And we talked about green, red, yellow flags. And we really tried to outline this because I agree this is important to be able to differentiate whether this is a peripheral lesion or central, uh, and, and especially with direct access. No, indeed. And we'll post the link to those papers and stuff in the show notes for you guys to take a listen to take a look at. So guys, I, I'm curious, what are some of the most challenging vestibular diagnoses or characteristics that you've treated? And what's some advice that you would give to clinicians that are perhaps struggling with these challenging diagnoses? Well, I, I get the tough ones in my area. One interesting person that I saw had BPBD recently, and she also um, was unstable at C1, C2. Um, so she had been in a major car accident. I mean, she got sandwiched by a, a big truck and uh, they decided not to do surgery on her and nobody would treat her. So she hadn't laid supine in seven months. And when she walked in the door, my, my first question was, has the nurse, does this neurosurgeon know that you're here? And the response was no, which made me quite nervous. Um, I actually repositioned her for BPBV with one of her cervical collars on. Uh, and I didn't even put her in any extension whatsoever, and she got better. So that was amazing. Um, and another challenge, I'm trying to write this guy up, was a guy with osteogenesis imperfecta. So I was afraid I'd kill him because he had basilar artery invagination, uh, which basically means you could <laughs> you could cut off the blood supply to his brain. Um, so that, nobody would see him either. He had actually seen five different clinicians before he came to me. And uh, I kind of thought through the problem, and he actually had horizontal canal BPPV. Got another person to help me, and I didn't break anything, which was a miracle. So, and actually, I saw him twice. Third time he was supposed to come back because I wasn't sure whether he was completely better. And between the second time I saw him and when he returned, uh, he had actually fractured three bones. So that was a, a big challenge for me. I think on uh, on my end too. Um being involved in vestibular and, and being kind of a major hub in a large city that um, we get a lot of doctors that will send patients and, and we become this, uh, I don't want to say latch, last ditch effort, but uh, the doctors have kind of run through several things and they're, they're hoping we can be the guys that will figure them out and not trying to, to um, be the hammer that sees everything as a, as a nail. Um, and wanting to kind of create a vestibular problem to to say, hey, you know, you are feeling some odd things, and maybe they just haven't found the right um, the the right medical diagnosis yet for what they've got going on. Um, and then, as you run them through, you know, we may find some vestibular deficiencies and weaknesses, and um, they'll do okay with therapy, but. Uh, that's that's not the major symptom driver for what that they they have going on. Um, and so allowing yourself to step back as a clinician and, and look at things just beyond the, the ear in and of itself. And it was interesting that Sue referenced the, the cervical spine because I, I've seen that a lot too with some of our, our clinicians and even myself is, is like you want it to be so much of this thing and then you step back and you go, oh my God, you know, the, the neck was really where I needed to be treating and not so much of the ear stuff. And you come in and you do a better cervical exam and you find that when you get into certain spots in there, um, you reproduce their main complaints and you're like, I should have, I should have been here the, the whole time. And you just kind of sometimes get tunnel vision. What do you think, you know, we've been talking a lot about what to look for as far as some of these um, conditions go. And I'm really glad RJ that you bring up the cervical spine because there's a lot of times where I'll have a patient who's a lot older will come in complain about dizziness, and then when you do investigate the cervical spine, it's actually a cervical spine problem, not necessarily an ear problem. Uh, what, what does the evidence say is the best treatment for treating some of these conditions like BPPV uh, when somebody comes in for dizziness? Um, I mean, well, if, if a patient's coming in for BPPV, doing a repositioning maneuver, um, whether it's posterior canal, horizontal canal um, problems, that that's going to be the biggest bang for your buck. Um, 
and then doing uh, a good vestibular exam, both like bedside screening and any you know testing whether stuff that you do or if you're working with uh, an otolaryngologist or neuro or audiology things like that to to get a better understanding of you know how diffuse or, or where the site of lesion might be that you're working on things to indicate certain parts for vestibular rehab whether you need to do um, balance retraining that we've talked about for you know older adults that have balance problems or if you're going to do some con uh, compensation type training VOR stuff postural stability pieces um, adaptation substitution type things if if you look like hey you know what the damage that's done here we might not get a good um, healing process but there's other ways to kind of circumvent how the system's working now to get to um, an end result that's going to allow you to to be you know highly functional with the activities that you're trying to do there's good evidence for for bpbv so the the clinical practice guideline from the American Academy of Head and Neck Surgery is really powerful. That just came out uh, last year. So that is a repeat, kind of a redo of the earlier one that I was an author on. And it, it, there's clear evidence that it works well. And also the Cochrane reviews state that it, it works very well too. Um, and there's no difference in the, doing the Epley versus the Samant. So that's there. Um, we just published, a, well, it wasn't just as years ago, I think now already, so we're starting to, to look at a rewrite of the clinical practice guideline for vestibular hypofunction. And there, there was, in parts, there's good evidence. In other parts, there's not great evidence yet. Um, that's what clinical practice guidelines do for conditions like neuritis, uh, labyrinthitis, uh, bilateral vestibular loss. So those are the conditions that we looked at, and primarily adults. So, so there's definitely mounting evidence that uh, uh, is out there, at least in clinical practice guidelines. So that's really wonderful. I think that's important, especially as you had kind of mentioned ref in reference to the clinical practice guidelines. But, you know, kind of I know you had mentioned some of the evidence there to both of you. Um, I'm kind of curious, just for the record here, in terms, of, in terms of the evidence, where are some of the areas that we really need more research on from a vestibular rehab standpoint? Uh, well, personally, uh, there's there's a plethora of new studies related to concussion, and that's going to continue. So I'm seeing just a, a, a huge bump, um, both by athletic trainers and PTs actually looking at that. Um, there's one of the things that, that we were concerned about is the, the, the frequency and intensity of the exercise, and we just got a grant from the Department of Defense that Anthony Contos and, and Tats Cardo of PIs and in the co-ion to look at exercise intensity. So if you give people more intense exercises, do they do better versus a lower dose of exercise? So that's one of the main questions I think that we have to answer in order to be more effective in our interventions with people with vestibular disorders. So those are a couple. And even in the clinical practice guideline, we have a whole section of, you know, this is what we this is what we know, but this is what we don't know. And uh, you know, if you think about it, you know, 30 years ago when I started doing this, uh, there was virtually, there were probably maybe seven or eight papers that existed in the world. And now if you go online and you search under vestibular rehab, you'll come up with probably, uh, you know, a thousand or more papers. So it's really blossomed over the last 30 years. So guys, I guess my next question would be then, what are some of the biggest misconceptions regarding either specific vestibular conditions or um, vestibular, uh, any conditions in general, really, that you feel that most PTs are not aware of? Well, one, one thing that I've learned over the years is that not everybody gets better completely. So, so that's, that was hard for me to accept. And, and I actually learned this from a group out of Australia, out of Michael Hamagi's lab, that they looked at people who compensated really well and people who compensated poorly, and they try to figure out, you know, why. And there, there are definitely um, factors that relate to poor recovery. And uh, we just presented something like that at CSM last year uh, because what we wanted to do is explain to people that it's not necessarily what they're doing, it's what the person brings to the situation that will make it harder for them to get better. So if you... For example, I have a vestibular neuritis and migraine, you're going to be harder to treat. If you have anxiety, you're going to be harder to treat. 
if you have fear of movement, uh, kinesiophobia, you're going to be harder to treat. So um, we're actually working on that right now with some of these factors. Uh, one of my PhD students is trying to develop a tool um, like the start back. So the start back can give you a pretty good idea of somebody who walks in with back pain as to whether they're going to get better or not. So what we've done is we've taken items from the start back from all kinds of other measures that we thought would potentially be predictive of whether the person was going to get better or not. And we're trying to develop a model for people with vestibular disorders. So when you walk in the door, you take this test and we're going to be able to say, mm, you probably going to get better on your own. You may not even need to see me. The middle group needs to see me. And then this other group may need to see me and a psychiatrist or some other people have yeah, behavioral management or whatever to try and help them get better, just like with back pain. So we're really looking at, you know, studying the back pain literature and trying to use that with this population to, to really be able to prognosticate and better identify and give the right care to the right person at the right time. I think that that's a really valuable statement, Sue, because, you know, if we can predict who needs more of our care, then potentially we can save some healthcare dollars as well. That's so good. Let's, let's talk a little bit about education. So one of our big jobs as physical therapists is to educate our patients. What advice would you give to clinicians about educating patients on the Epley after you've performed it? Uh, yeah, I, I have some reservations on having patients do their own Epleys, mostly because I've seen, you know, Epleys go bad in the clinic even while I'm doing them, and I would not want the patient to put themselves into uh, a harmful situation, number one, um, if they happen to relocate the debris into a different canal or, or cause some other issues that makes them, you know, severely sick, um, they may not be uh, quickly remedied from that by doing it on their own. And there's always the chance that we've, we've solved it one way in the clinic and the next time that they would need it, it wouldn't necessarily need to be done that way. Uh, so I, I don't want my patient kind of going in blind trying to, to solve a problem that can be somewhat complex. Uh, so I tend to ask them if they start to experience symptoms again just to come back to the office. I agree completely. I rarely ever teach anybody to do the Epley at home. Uh, I've had a lot of disasters, and I'm sure RJ's had the same problem. When people go online and try to do it, do it themselves, what I've found is that they end up with multiple canal involvement. It's not been a, a positive experience for me. The Radke paper is when it was first reported in 2005, and they didn't report any complications, but I've certainly seen them. And I'm also afraid that someone is going to extend their head too much when they do the epilate and compromise their vertebral basal, basal or circulation. So my criteria are, and this is just Sue Whitney's criteria, <laughs> they have to be smart, they have to bring a partner, and they have to bring the pillow that they're, they're going to do it over so that I can see that they can do it safely and I document all those things. Because in this litigious society, you, you can get sued for almost anything. And certainly if somebody were to go home and have a stroke well, after I taught them how to do this, uh, I guarantee I'd lose the case unless I really carefully document it. So those are my rules. I know that other people do it. It's their license online. Um, I value my license and I'm very cautious about trying to, to put somebody in a potentially compromising position. Um, I think Sue referenced the practice guidelines earlier from BPPV. So something you know, I, I, when I kind of talk about this with, you know, some of the students that I, I've worked with, I talk about how like ACL post-op rehab has changed from like immobilized forever to like get it moving uh, today if we can. Um, I think there was a, a classic kind of, um, if you were repositioned, then you should not have the head or neck move at all for, you know, a significant amount of time. Sometimes I've, I've heard stories of people being put in braces and told not to move their head for five days. Um, and mm -hmm. from what I've seen um, in the, the, the um, practice guidelines that have come out is, is that like post maneuver precautions maybe don't have the strongest evidence uh, that they need to be issued uh, for, for patients. And um, I tend to tell my patients that they may feel uh, to a degree that 
um, we've kind of stirred some stuff up and they may feel, a, uh, you know, a little off balance, a little uneasy for the next uh, few hours through the rest of that day. But hopefully over the next day or two, they kind of start to um, feel more normalized again, um, back to, to their usual balanced self. And what I said is their body started to try to figure out how to be balanced in this weird state. And now if we've put it back to normal, it's got to kind of figure out how to be normal again. Um, but most people within like that 48 hour window tend to feel significantly better. Um, and if I have a stubborn case that I can't seem to get resolved with one or two treatments in the office, then I might extend um, just giving them some precautionary positions to avoid. That's been my experience with it. I agree, RJ. Uh, and there's absolutely no evidence that, um, that you need to do anything after. But I can tell you, just, just like you, I, I tell people not to look up or down for a couple hours after. And yeah. don't, don't lay down until you go to bed. And that's all I do. Um, there are there's a recent paper that came out that said just be careful about where you sleep, or if you sleep on that side, that's the side you might get BBBV. Those ideas are out there, but you know I've also seen people that I had one gal who came in after she had had BBBV, had it resolved, came back ten years later, and she a physical therapist told her not to sleep on one side, so she actually had she had a wound on her ear because she had slept on that side exclusively for the past 10 years. So you've got to be really careful about telling people what not to do, because there really isn't good evidence to, to tell people not to do anything. There is some beginning evidence that suggests that BPV may be related to vitamin D deficiency. So I do ask people if they're osteoporotic or osteopenic, and uh, have they had a bone density test recently? So that I have changed over the last... Uh, year or two since I've seen some more evidence in that area. Yeah, you guys both bring up really great points. And, you know, I, I think it's important for all clinicians, whether they're new grad or, or been working for a while, to recognize that, you know, hey, maybe we shouldn't be educating the patients about doing this on their own. I think that's a really key take-home point right there. And, you know, when we were in school, we learned numerous screening tests. Um, and, of course, now we kind of know that some of the orthopedic special tests do not have great reliability or validity at this point. But my question is, how reliable and valid are our screening assessments in the clinic when it comes to these vestibular conditions? Depends on which one. Even the Vicks Hall Pike isn't completely um, reliable in, in terms. So there's there's a paper by Vera Ray and Balo that says that you need to do it more than once. So you may stir up those otoconia first go round, and then the second time you may actually see a positive test for the torsional beating nystagmus. So sometimes you have to do it more than once. Um, the head impulse test, the reliability is somewhere uh, between 70 and 80 uh, percent, and that's if you do it right. So, you know, you're going to miss some that way. The head shake test isn't quite as good as that. So, the, you know, it's, they're, they really vary depending on what, what test um, it actually is. If, if we, you know, there's, there's like uh, the mechanical um, head impulse test that's much better. But, you know, that costs, you know, fifteen, eighteen thousand dollars $18,000. So, you know, you can certainly improve your reliability uh, sometimes with electronic measures or uh, technical equipment, but most of us can't afford that kind of stuff. Yeah, and I think um, if you go on the, the neurology section through the APTA, they have the, um, the vestibular edge review of, mm -hmm. um, like, a, a vast amount of vestibular testing. Um, that reviews kind of the, the evidence strength and, and you know, how and when it, it should be apl applicable to your, your care and then what other similar measures are out there that test um, in the same domains of it. So that's an excellent reference if you want to dive into the research side of it. And I even tell you by setting too, you're right, RJ. So outpatient setting, hospital setting, et cetera. It's very yeah. helpful. That was put together by the Academy of, uh, of Neurologic PT. If a new grad would like to get better at treating patients with uh, vestibular pathology, are there any resources that you guys can recommend? So, I mean, there's there's a handful of good um, good courses that are out there. Um, I, I think the, the Herdman course is always the, the gold standard for a lot of the vestibular uh, people that get interested in that. But there's there's other ones out there. Um, was it is it Karen Scope that has a, like a concussion vestibular uh, uh, course out there. Um, I actually followed uh, some of your stuff off of 
of MedBridge, and um, I know Anne's on there as well. So I think there's a ton of content um, now that we live in the digital age that you can access through podcasts and online educational tools. Um, I've been doing stuff with the Institute of Clinical Excellence, um, starting the, the dizziness and vestibular stuff with them. Um, just trying to get get some information out there. Uh, I think there's a lot of like like Sue had mentioned earlier with you know years ago the amount of papers that were out there in vestibular to what's happening now. More clinicians are getting excited about it, so you're starting to see this generation have a little bit more of a digital presence, which should continue to increase over the next few years, which will allow you know easier access to content and it's, mentorship. I just wanted to mention two other sources: the Academy of Neurologic PT offers a, a kind of a basic vestibular course and an advanced one that was put together by some really good folks. And the Journal of Vestibular Research has a YouTube channel that has some very nice talks about differential diagnosis by some of the best neurologists in the world. So that would be a really good resource for somebody who especially wanted to look at eye movements and get better at uh, diagnosing people by um, their abnormal eye movements. Um, so Michael Stroop is on it. Uh, there's my, uh, Michael Hamagi, et cetera. So there, there's some of, truly some of the best neurologists in the world there. Well, thank you for that. As I think that's a very helpful list of resources for clinicians and educators to consider for that. And, you know, I want to switch gears a little bit and kind of focus more on the education realm. And so my question is, what are your guys' thoughts on how vestibular rehabilitation education is carried out in DPT programs across the country? And and what are the biggest issues in vestibular rehab education in the U.S.? Well, I don't think we know the answer to your question. That's what Ann Galgon is now doing a survey to try and figure out what PT educational programs do in the United States. I, I know what I do at Pitt, but I'm not sure that uh, my guess is that there are very few programs that have the ability to do what I do with our students. So we don't know the answer. Yeah, while I was in school, um, I, uh, I had faculty, Dr. Jennifer Nash, who was practicing um, vestibular pretty regularly, um, co-teach our neuro rehab uh, section. And the school had given her the ability to do a couple lectures with some labs with it. And um, since I've graduated, I've kind of come back in and I've filled that spot that she was teaching that at. And she now teaches at UNLV. Um, the major public uh, university here in Las Vegas. And uh, I, I know they have like a full course dedicated to vestibular. So I kind of feel fortunate to be in a, in a community that takes a lot of time to educate their PT students in this field. But I know that that's the, the exception and not the rule. Yeah. So given that, what would you guys advice be as far as how to, kind of integrate vestibular um, information into DBT education? I think, you know, as we talk about things like falls and other neurological conditions, balance in and of itself plays into all of those things. So um, I think if faculty were looking at, at how to maybe get more of this content in there, if they front loaded some of their um, possibly neuro stuff with the fundamentals of vestibular, you could talk about, how that system is, is involved and influenced in all of these other conditions. And so you could, could kind of be bringing it up as you're talking about, you know, other neurological issues. So the, the content's kind of like piggybacking off of other topics as well. Um, if you can't dedicate a ton of, of your classwork time to doing it. Yeah, I, I hope it, it will change because uh, as I think some programs don't do much. And this is a, a high impact I, there's a lot of evidence for what we do. So I'm hoping that people will start to better understand that and, and teach the evidence because uh, truly, if you look at neuro rehab, this is one of the, the best referenced areas in terms of, of practice. I really appreciate that you said that because, you know, the NPTE does not really focus on vestibular rehabilitation. And a lot of programs are teaching to the NPTE. Do you think that it should have more presence on the national exam? And if so, what would you recommend the changes be? I definitely think so. I've, I've written questions, so they just didn't take them because I've been an item writer for the exam. And so maybe they, you know, they, they, it's interesting because 
the exam is supposedly written based on what practice is. And I know people certainly are, are at least treating BPD out there. So I guess I don't really quite understand. Um, hopefully the next time that the Federation, yes, Federation State Boards does a practice analysis that people will reflect that they're actually doing it and then they'll include it on the exam because that's, that's how they change the exam. I remember one question on my exam, and it was a uh, left Dix Hall pipe was the answer. That was all the vestibular <laughs> content I needed to be aware of. So that was it. Well, I wrote a lot of good questions that I can tell you. <laughs> you know, guys, because I know with, you know, of course, with DBT education, yes, there's FSBPT in their role, but also another prominent fi figure and organization that's involved within education is CAPTI. Um, do you guys kind of know what are the CAPTI requirements in terms of when it comes to vestibular rehabilitation for that? I don't. Um, sorry, I, I, I don't know that. Maybe you do better than I. Um, I. I think that people are expected to at least know what Dix Hall Pike is and maybe the Apley, but I'm, I'm not sure it goes too much beyond that. Yeah, no, fair enough. So, guys, I, I thank you for the talk with everything, because I think I've definitely learned quite a few new things today regarding vestibular rehabilitation and education. And, you know, with this la for each episode, we like to ask this final question to every single guest, because we'd love to hear what everyone's thoughts are. And the question is, if you could change one aspect of healthcare education, whether that be DPT or other healthcare provider related, which aspect would you change and how would you change it? Whew. Um... That's a heavy question. That's a that's a big one. Um, I really enjoy, you know, still still I consider myself very young in my career um, and new to this. Getting to mentor with uh, all different types of people and and diversifying that mentorship. Um, so I would love to see continued encouragement to not come out of uh, your program and then feel like you are. Uh, you know, obligated to the nine to five clinical grind every day and keep your head down um, uh, on that sense. And like, I know there's the stipulations that we have in Nevada, you know, continuing education that's due every year. Um, and I know for some people, it becomes like a checkoff box, like they just take some course to just get it done and move on. Um, and I have taken the opportunity over the last handful of years to take almost every course that uh, I've been interested in and tried to stay and, and meet and talk to the people that have taught that course. And I kind of have a rule that is I, I try to always go to lunch at least one of the days if I have a weekend course with the course instructor. Um, and I ask them about business. I ask them about what they've seen in their career and practice wise, what techniques that they value that they don't get to teach during the actual weekend course or whatever. Um, I think there's tremendous value in getting to just learn from everybody uh, in our profession that has, has been doing it from any setting, regardless to what you specifically practice in, because you might pick something up from the musculoskeletal guy that comes in and you can plug it into your neuro case that you would have never made that bridge otherwise. Um, and so looking to, to be able to, to kind of cross reference all of the content and just be a consumer of knowledge through mentorship. And, and I guess I really think that people learn well by cases. That's, I, I like stories. And there's, there's really a, a lot of literature now that talks about storytelling is extremely powerful for people remembering things. And that's how I remember my patient interactions, and that's how I learn lessons. So I think that as physical therapy educators, we need to do more storytelling um, so that those ideas and, and things that you learn from the, the good things, we, we call them sometimes uh, the goods and the bads, you know, like you screwed up. All of us screw up, and we all need to understand what the screw up was so that the next generation or the person you're working with doesn't screw up too. So I think incorporating more storytelling into the education process is a powerful thing. Yeah, those are some great answers, you guys. And I can't thank you enough for coming on tonight uh, to talk to us about all things vestibular. Where can people find you online and on social media if they have any follow-up questions or just want to chat? I tend to do most of my stuff via Facebook. I'm not very active on Twitter. Um, so uh, on Facebook, I'm 
I think facebook.com williams.rj uh, if you want to find me because there's probably a lot of us out there um, if you just throw that in the search bar. Uh, I also do stuff for the Institute of Clinical Excellence. Um, so I'll be on their podcasts every couple weeks talking dizziness stuff. And then if you've pulled me up on Instagram, it's usually just videos of me working out and pictures <laughs> of my food. So um, might not be the best educational or clinical relevant place to follow me, but I'm on there as well. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. and I'm on uh, Facebook and also email. So just my last name, which is Whitney at pit.edu, P-I-T-T dot E-D-U. And I try to answer all emails and uh, I post, uh, I'm starting to post more and more things about vestibular on Facebook. Awesome. Awesome. I really appreciate your time, guys. We, we're so appreciative for you guys coming on to, to talk to our audience today. So thank you so much. Good luck. You're doing a great job. Yeah, thank you guys. Access to healthcare is one of the largest issues facing both providers and patients, as millions of people worldwide lack timely and affordable access to healthcare. Anywhere Healthcare, a telehealth platform, is a simple, low cost option for providers and patients that eliminates the barriers to access to all kinds of healthcare. To find out more, check out anywhere.healthcare, which is available on our show notes. And if you use the code HET in all caps when you email to sign up, you'll save 25% off the total cost. Thank you for attending class today, and we hope that you learned something and gained value from the content. If you'd like to schedule office hours with us, feel free to add us on Twitter at HET Podcast, on Instagram, HET Podcast, on Facebook, the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, and the homepage, healthcareeducationtransformationpodcast.com. And for those of you following along in the syllabus, extra credit can be obtained by liking us, sharing us, and leaving a review. Let's continue our journey up Mount Educational Success as lifelong learners.